All right, we're going to do part two tonight. Uh, I've titled the messages, uh, Why I Believe the Reconciliation of All Things is the Truth. And I've basically got three points here, but I kind of need to rename it of uh, these are three of many reasons why I believe. These are not the only three reasons why I believe the reconciliation of all things is truth. But it is three things that was kind of on my mind. Part one was on the sanctification. We looked at sanctification last week, the true meaning of sanctification. Sanctification does not mean sinless. It means set apart. It means separated. Just as the Israelites, back whenever God would tell them to separate the tenth, from the herd that would be your tithe and when you would set it apart he said for this is holy unto the Lord in other words it was separated it was set apart it was different than the others why was it different a lot of them wasn't that different it just said the tenth the fact that it was sanctified it was set apart that's what made it different to look at the animal you might not have even saw any difference between the rest of the herd it just fell in the tenth spot. <laughs> now there was a sacrifice with the, the, the precious lamb, the spotless lamb. But that was a different type of sacrifice. That was a sacrifice. The tithe, the tenth, was something set apart. It was sanctified. And we looked at how what you believe, that if you examine all of the religions of the world, you lay them out in front of you how the believers of reconciliation of all through Jesus Christ stand different than all the others. And we compared that. Even Christianity today is not that different than your other mainstream religions. It's all self-work based. It's all about self. It's all about you. We talked about even how the people that believe in reincarnation, that's still self the better I do in this life, I'll come back as a dove instead of a worm. or so. I don't know how that works. But they, they believe for you to reach that nirvana or that climax. It's about, the, about you being a better person. It's about you climbing that spiritual ladder. That's how Muslims are. All of them. You don't believe the way I believe? Then you're going to be tormented throughout eternity. The Egyptians believe that. The Muslims believe that. Today's Christianity believe that. And although they do have their differences, they've got a lot of similarities. But when you're talking about the salvation of all, that stands alone. That stands alone. And we spoke about sanctification. But anyway, tonight, part two of this, and I want to start off by just bringing a thought out to you that I've heard many times. If this teaching is true, then why doesn't more people believe it? You don't understand, Brother Allen. My pastor's been preaching for 45 years. He's been to four different Bible colleges. And I went to him and asked him about this, and he said this is not true. Why didn't Billy Graham believe in the salvation of all? Why don't John Hagee believe in it? Charles Stanley. I mean, there's some really brilliant men in this world that make their living st studying and teaching the Word of God. And they do not teach the salvation of all. Why? If it's that plain. Because let me ask you guys something. Me and Harold's had this conversation. Once God showed this truth to me, it was so plain that I can't look at the Bible without seeing it. Matter of fact, we've got a series of messages of how the Old Testament, you can see it in the Old Testament. You can see it in the King James Bible. You don't have to get in the NIV or any other version. You can preach it straight from the King James. Why don't these people see it? Why am I the only person in my town, Brother Allen? Why am I the only person in my family that sees this? If it's so true. I get people that talk to me that they see it. <clears throat> but then they've got doubt.
It reminded me of someone. Anybody remember? Turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 19. First Kings chapter number 19. This is old Elijah. We're going to probably start reading in verse number 10. No, let's read number, uh, hold on. go back to verse number 3 and 4. This is Elijah. The prophet of God, verse 1, start there and give you a context. And Ahab, and Ahab, which Ahab was one of the most wicked kings to ever rule over Israel. God put him in power, but he was wickeder in sin, son. Mean. Bible never says one good thing about King Ahab or Jezebel. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and with how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, Elijah, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die and said, Is it enough? It, 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 it is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. O Elijah said, they've all come up against me. Now even the queen has set out a decree to kill me. Here I am, Lord, trying to do your will, wanting to do what you want to do. And, and he said, oh, woes, woes is me. I'm the only one. He's sitting underneath the juniper tree having a pity party saying, why am I the only one? Verse 10 and he says, I have been very ze jealous of the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left. You hear that? God, I'm the only one. I used to believe that. Everybody going to hell but me. <laughs> I'm the only one saved around here. God... Why ain't everybody as good as I am? <laughs> and they seek my life to take it away. Elijah felt like he was all alone. But I want you to notice something down in verse number 18. This is God talking. He says, Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. God had to remind him, Elijah, you ain't the only one. I got 7,000 more Israelites that has not bowed the knee to Baal. You're not by yourself. There's other people out there. I've got other people out there. Now, I've got you sanctified. I've got you separated. I've told some people this before. Because guess what, guys? You go on the Internet today and thank the Lord for the Internet in this aspect, that we can communicate with one another. Because without the Internet, you would literally feel like Elijah. I'm the only sinking person on this earth that believes this way. Why, do I Why are these thoughts going through my mind? My dad used to say it. He used to sit in religion, and he wasn't buying it. Donna has said it, but she didn't have the... They didn't have the proof to prove it. You get what I'm saying? They were, they were something inside of me that just, I just wasn't buying this eternal torment thing. But, but I didn't have the proof. But they felt alone. They felt, and if you didn't have other people communicating, it'd be hard, to, it'd be easy to convince yourself, I'm by myself. Am I losing my mind? And there's people that think that. But let me remind you, God's got more people on this earth that believe exactly the way you do. It's just not all in one town. As a matter of fact, we were talking about that in the Ohio meeting, I believe, and, and we were talking about that. And you know why I believe God's got it like that? 
I think he's done it exactly on purpose because things don't just happenstance for God. God does, and he's called every single person. He knows every single person that knows the truth. Why did he put three in Ohio, four in Texas, two in Chicago? You get what I'm saying? We've been called the mega church, guys. All ten of you. <laughs> we're the mega church. All twenty of us when we're all here at one time. Yeah, you up there in the balcony talking to y'all too. <laughs> It is that. Because if you read about Elijah, you go back and you read up to that point. You know what he did? He goes to bed. Look what he did. After verse 4, look at verse number 5. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. The point behind that was is that sometimes God's get up, got to get us by ourselves and to show you it's Him taking care of you. You don't need me. Technically. Now, yes, is it good to have fellowship? Absolutely. But sometimes we get so reliant upon each other that we're actually dependent on each. I need your assurance. You know, I need you agreeing with me to make sure I'm right. I need you to back me up. No, you back up from right here. Sometimes God wants us to stand on Him and on Him alone. Can you serve Him by yourself? You should be able to. If our faith was where it needs to be, talked to Brother Whalen about it the other day. And a lot of times the reason people doubt is because they don't have this book down in their heart. Once you study something and you get something for sure in your heart, it don't take nobody else assuring you. The fact that you've learned it for yourself is assurance enough. But one reason I think God has got people spread out like that, because think about it, He won't let us organize. We're too far away from each other. And any time man organizes, they screw it up. You let man get together and organize something, they'll corrupt it every time. There's not an instance in the Bible that proves otherwise. So you know what he's done? He's put the true Elijahs. I got an Elijah over here, and I got an Elijah over there, and I got an Elijah over here. And guess what? I put just enough distance between them. They can't organize but maybe once or twice a year. And you got to drive six hours to do it. Does that make sense? But it still don't take away. But I want to encourage you tonight. Let's look at some things. Let's look at some things. Just a reminder. People are blinded. The reason people don't see things... Oh, here's another. All right, let's, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm sorry. Then you've got another example. That God doesn't use the multitudes. Remember a, a gentleman by the name of Gideon? His army was of thousands. And God started, long story short, God put Gideon and his army through a few tests... And say, I mean, even one of the tests was, I want you to go down to the river and I want you to examine the men of the way that they drink water. Said for the ones that get down and lap with a dog on one knee and lap, bring the water up to their mouth, he said, I want you to sit them to the side. He said, the ones that get down on all fours and drink, put them to the other side. And the Bible says that the ones that lapped water like a dog was the number of 300. Right? God says, I want you to take them 300 and we're going to go to war with them. That was the minority, by the way. Started out with thousands. Dwindled his army down to 300. 
300. And if you keep reading the story, you know how they, and now they were going up against thousands of people in an army now. You know how they won that battle? God gave them, I mean, he's, Gideon gave them all 300 of them trumpets and a pitcher, a clay pitcher, and put lamps in those pitchers. And they got up there and they spread them all out on the hillside next to each other one by one, all the way from one end to the other. And Gideon says that whenever I give the mark, I want all of you to blow the trumpet and break those pots, which is going to suddenly let the light shine through the cracks of that pot. And said that whenever they did that, that the army, and you can imagine the appearance, you heard trumpets from that end to that end. They appeared to be bigger than they really were and they appeared to be more than they really were and it says that the enemy ran in frantic, didn't know, and said they went down there and slew them all. Point being behind it, when God's small crowd lets their light shine and the trumpet blowing is a sound of victory, little as much when God is in it. If God be for us, who can be against us? That, that thought process goes through my mind whenever I read that story. So there is another example, and the Bible is full of examples of God using the minority. Okay? <clears throat> and just a reminder, people are blinded is the reason people doesn't, does not believe the gospel. People are blinded. In John chapter number 12, some of y'all might not have ever heard this one, but turn over here and read that verse with me. John chapter number 12, and then we're going to go on to these other points right quick because I've got to just let you see because there's a lot of people out there. When you talk about why doesn't people see or believe, it's because they're free willingly not choosing God. That is not what the Bible teaches. Read in John chapter number 12, in verse number 37, he says, But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him, that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report? And to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore, they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart and be converted, and I should heal them. Do you hear what that said? They could not believe. There is a blinding there. But let's look at a few verses right quick. Matthew chapter number 7. Matthew chapter number 7. Because i got to admit, guys, to you before we go any further, I have sympathy for those because I understand that. My mind still plays tricks on me sometimes too. My mind still plays tricks on me. There's really, 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 really smart people that doesn't see this truth. But you know what I'm reminded of whenever people use that type of reasoning? Why don't Charles Stanley see this? He's a really, really, really smart man. Well, you know what? Was Stephen Hawkins a really, really smart man? He didn't even believe in God. So being really, 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 really smart obviously is not the plumb line because there's really, really, really smart Muslims. There's really, really, really smart atheists. There's really, really, really smart Scientologists. No, never mind. No, there's not. <laughs> so being really, really, really smart is not the criteria of knowing the truth. Because let's look at a few things. Matthew chapter number 7, verses number 13 and 14. Read what this says with me. Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many be there which go in thereat. 
Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Now, how many of y'all ever heard these verses of Scripture teaching, that's heaven and hell? That's heaven and hell right there. See, more people going to hell than going to heaven. But that's not talking about heaven and hell. You go back and you read up to these points and read after it. Read what it says. Verse 12, Therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Read after that. Be, verse 15, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. He's talking about in this life. He's not talking about an afterlife. He's not talking about straight is the gate that leadeth to heaven. He's talking about two choices in this life, right and wrong. God's way, not God's way. He's talking about the decisions that we make in this life right here. And what does he say? Who finds it and who don't? Few that find it. But many, where's the many? We're talking about the many right now. The many versus the few. The many are the ones that here, it says, but and many there be that go in thereat. They follow the ways of destruction. They follow the ways that is not right. The ones that lead to death. Spiritual death. Because remember, we were dead men walking and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. More's going to go that way. Few there be that find it. Keep reading over in Matthew. Here's, a, here's another one that's always taken out of context. Verse 21. Same chapter, verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many, now remember he's talking about the kingdom. Again, this is not talking about heaven and hell. This is talking about his kingdom. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye, ye that work iniquity. What's so funny about that verse of Scripture, I used to hear Baptist preachers use that verse of Scripture to lean over this pulpit and say, See there, bless God, there's some of you sitting out here if you don't accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, He's going to look at you and say, I never knew you. That ain't who He's talking to. Read who He's talking to. He ain't talking to the hookers. He ain't talking to the drug dealers. He ain't talking to the sinners. He said, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not, have we not brought the covered dishes to the every dinner? <laughs> many will say unto me, Lord, Lord, did I not mow the church's yard every Saturday morning faithfully for 25 years? Many will say unto me, Lord, Lord, did I not go to the retirement center and have a jail ministry every third Thursday out of the month? Remember me, Lord? I was associate pastor. I was the greeter at the back door. Remember me, Lord? He's not talking to the street thugs. He's talking to people that thought they were doing for God. He was talking to religious people. He was talking to people that were doing. And how many does he say is going to be doing that, saying that? Many. 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 You feeling any better about being by yourself yet? You want another one? Minnie Mouse is the only many I'm interested in. <laughs> I don't want to be a part of a many. Read this with me. 
Turn with me to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter number 24. Here's a mini. Matthew chapter number 24. Verse number 11. Read that with me. King James says, And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. All right. Now, we've been called false prophets. We've been called, people that preach the reconciliation of all things have been called false prophets. And, and y'all have been said, y'all have been deceived. But let me stop and ask you this. When it comes to thinking about those that are preaching the salvation of all, does the word many <laughs> come to your mind? Not too many. Not too many. That's the only way you can use many. Not too many. But does the word many by itself? And it says that they shall deceive many. Now, I don't mean to pick on people, but there's three churches in this one town. Let's just say that everybody that was members of every church in town would show up, have a special day. We're having family day. We're having Pack-A-Pew Sunday. <laughs> and we're going to be serving chicken after church We'd have, and hot dogs. That's right. You got to get them all here. Let's say that every member of every church in town showed up at their churches on the same Sunday. Would we be the many? If every one of us, and I'll be honest with you, and I've told people this, we've got people that has come through here, believe the truth, but because they're just not big church going, you know what I'm saying? Or either they got jobs, they can't make it. They just don't come anymore. I've literally had people that came to this meetings three years ago. We're going on our eighth year. Years ago. Ain't been here in years. Contacts me and say, Brother Allen, just want to let you know I still believe the truth even though I'm not there. You know how encouraging that is? Seen them at the barbecue joint. Brother Allen, I know. See, I thought I'd done tick somebody off. The reason, like, but I've got to understand. Sometimes this is just an oasis for people to go through and God give them the truth and then go back into your life. Because it ain't about a building. You know I hate dandelions. And that's why God made And some go into my yard from my neighbor's yard and I spray them. And the dog. <laughs> but if everybody in this town, I counted it up in my mind the other day, which I probably shouldn't do that. I shouldn't worry about that. But I did. I wanted to think if everybody that I can remember that came through this place that professed this belief, if everybody was here, there'd be around 100 people. In this town, I'm saying in the surrounding, the China Grove, Lexington, this area. 100 people. That's a third of what a normal church service in other churches would be. Now remember, Jesus said, many false prophets will arise. Are there many people preaching the reconciliation of all things? Now, how many do we have preaching that failed Jesus? How many do we have teaching that God forsaken false doctrine, false teaching of eternal conscious torment? Many. On every corner. So yet, we don't fit that category. We don't fit that category, do we? So you see, guys, 
you look back into the scriptures, you see where God's used the few. Think about this. Remember that verse? How many disciples did Jesus have? Twelve. The scriptures say that many believed on him. Like, in the, you know, there's many people that believed on him. But there's one verse of scripture in there that says, but they wouldn't profess him because of the fear of the Jews. You can bet your tail, ladies and gentlemen. There's people in these other churches. They believe it. But won't admit it. You know why? I saw what they did to that, that them people down there. I don't want to be shunned. I don't want to be called a, a, a cult. I don't want to be called a freak, a weirdo for going believing that. I don't want to be called that. Guess what? God's people's been called weirdos and freaks ever since there was a God's people. They've been the weird ones. Matter of fact, let me just, just got some more. Let me find it. There are two types. Remember, there has to be a revealing. Those that don't see it, there's a blinding. Okay? Now, how many of you used to not see the truth? It was me. You were blinded. All right, so what happened to you to see the truth? A revealing, that's right. The scales fell off our eyes. There has to be a revealing. Now, I want you to consider something. If you see the truth, if you see this teaching, that should say something to you. Because there's two types of people in this world when it comes to seeing the truth. Those that see it and those that don't. Now, I'm a perfect example that just because I don't see it right now don't mean that I'm not going to see it 15 years from now. I remember going to my Bible college, the one little rinky-dink Bible college I went to. I remember being taught that men like me are heretics. That cult class, remember? We learned what cults were. You know what cults are? Everybody except for Baptists. I found that out. Cults are anybody but Baptists. Didn't know that. Did y'all know that? It's what they taught me. Guess, where I, guess what kind of church I was in? Coincidence? There's even some more Baptist churches to go. <laughs> That's right. That's right. If it wasn't that belief, you're a cult. But 15 years later, here we stand. But have you ever seen people? And I saw it whenever I was shown. And see, the thing about it is, if you would have, just like it was presented to me back then, but I didn't see it. Oh, they're cults. Oh, that's crazy. Crazy. Everybody going to wind up in heaven one day. I said it myself. I guess we all can just live the way we want to. <laughs> I said it. But then 15 years later, God had prepared some heart, tilled the ground, put some preparation of the heart in there, and at the right moment, I saw it. Why didn't I see it back then? Amen. Amen. Most Christians don't even know to look for the truth because they think they got it. You don't know to look for the truth if you think you're in it. One of the first things that I try to do to people is try to show them where they've got flaw in what they believe. But, look at, and and, and, but listen, if you see it but are conflicted because really, really, really smart men and the many are telling you that you're wrong. Think about that. If that's the scenario, you need to consider that. 
you're letting the very thing that should be encouraging you to discourage you. I used to battle this. I used to battle this. Why ain't, my, why ain't these chairs filled up? We got the best news in town. Why ain't this place filled up tonight? Why aren't people beating their doors down to get in here? We've got the best news. Do you not realize that these mamas out here that think their children are burning in hell right now, we've got the good news. But they, yet they go back to their bad news churches every Sunday, Sunday night and Wednesday night. Why are, why are these? Let me tell you something. These chairs get full. Somebody needs to sit me down. Because I'm not preaching the truth if these chairs fill up. I was letting the very thing that biblically should be encouraging me was the thing that was discouraging me and it was because I was thinking with my flesh and not the truth. God has never did anything using the majority. Never. He does know his neighbors. That's right. It has always been the minority. <laughs> yeah, no three monkeys, only two. Sorry. Listen, matter of fact, there's examples just like with the Gideon. There can be too many. There can be too many for God. And you know why that is? For Him to get the glory. Little is much when God is in it. The story ain't is a lot is a lot when God's not in it. And you know what I'm saying? That's, that saying God is saying from a purpose. Little is much when God is in it. He gets the glory. And on the believing and not believing thing, I'm just going to throw this to the, on, in there for you right quick, just a thought. I was thinking about this, using Pharaoh. God sent Moses to tell Pharaoh, let my people go. But Pharaoh didn't let his people go. Did Pharaoh listen to God? Was Pharaoh disobeying God? Moses said, let my people go. But Pharaoh said, no. But there's more to that story. The Bible said God hardened Pharaoh's heart. So the answer to that question is both. He listened to him and he didn't, li he didn't listen to Moses' side, but, but Pharaoh was doing exactly what God had him to do. That's hard to, gra That's hard to wrap your mind around when you think about it. So was he in the will of God or not? <laughs> Evil. Yeah. He does it all. They are doing exactly what God would have them to do for this time, for this moment, right now. Just like me and you, me 15 years ago, was I lost? Absolutely. But was I where God wanted me at that time? Absolutely. Absolutely. And here's where we're going to end it up. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. These verses always encourage me. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. Begin reading with me in verse number 18. This is Paul writing to the church at Corinth. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But to us which are saved, it is the power of God. 
The cross is the power of God, isn't it? For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. What does bring to nothing? What's another word for that? Destroy. I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. He asks questions. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made the foolish had made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. <laughs> and he's talking about man's wisdom here. You know them really, 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 really smart men? It's because they're really, 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 really smart is the reason they don't know God. Romans chapter 1 says, professing themselves to be wise, they become fools. For after they, the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. Ain't that what we preach? Christ for crucified. Done. Jews, unto the Jews, it's a stumbling block. And unto the Greeks, foolishness. Can't be that simple. You got to do something. You got to do something. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Isn't that what the salvation of all makes Christ? The power of God and the wisdom of God. Plus nothing, minus nothing. It's all Jesus. We're the only belief that believes that way. The only one. You say, well, Brother Allen, I believe in Jesus. Yeah, but you also believe you got to accept, confess, believe, cut cartwheels, tithe, give, cover dishes, hot dogs, hamburgers, dinners, and all that. You got to act right, talk right, spit white. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. But other than that, it's all Jesus. It's all Jesus. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than man and the weakest weakness of God is stronger than man. You know what that verse right there says? If God could have a dumb day, he's still wiser than any man that's ever lived. God's smarter than any human being on a dumb day. God don't have gum dumb days. But that's what he says. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than man and the weakness of God is stronger than men. God's not foolish and God's not weak. He's just saying. <laughs> now keep reading. Remember them you are called. Now let's look at the called. Verse 26. For ye see your calling, brethren. You see your calling. I want you to look at your calling, Susie. I want you to look at your calling. How not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many mo noble are called. Any uh, rocket scientists in here today? Anybody in here ever discovered anything new like, you know, any kings or princesses? Anybody in here? Other than Caitlin, she's queen. <laughs> Verse 27. But God hath chose the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chose the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. And base things of the world and things that which are despised. Which God chosen, hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in His presence. But of Him are ye in Christ Jesus, whom of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification, set apart, and redemption, that, ac that according as it is written, He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. You know why I'm chosen? Because I got 15 plaques on my wall. Because I've been to four different colleges. 
You know why God called me? Because I've been preaching 45 years, amen. You know why God called me? Because I'm a really, really, really smart hillbilly. Right? God calls men like you and me. There's no plaques on my wall. The Bible college that I went to ain't even really a Bible college. It was corresponding courses through the cult I was a part of. Why does he do it that way? That no flesh should glory in his presence. You listen to Charles Stanley, guess who gets the glory? I tell you what, you need to listen to Charles Stanley. He's a really smart man. He's a genius. I mean, he can just pull some things out of that Bible and he can just preach some of the message. He, he, Charles Stanley, he, Charles, 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 Charles Stanley. You know Mr. Stanley, don't you? He's so smart. He's been, I don't know how many colleges he's been to. I just love listening to Charles Stanley. He's just so wonderful. Charles Stanley. You know Charles Stanley, don't you? He, he is so smart. I ain't heard nothing about God yet. But you know what? I get emails, and I'm not bragging on myself because it's, it's about him. God, I get emails and saying, I thank God for what he's doing with you, Brother Allen. I love to hear that. You know why? Because they recognize it's not me because I ain't nothing but a redneck from Gold Hill. I was a C and D student in high school, man. I wasn't even on a roll. But for some reason, he blesses this ministry. Tell the truth. You don't have to be a genius. Just tell the truth. Just preach the Bible. Let the Bible be the wisdom. Let Jesus be the wisdom. Let Jesus be the smart, smart, smart guy. Not me. Lord, I get words mixed up when I'm trying to make notes in right in front of you. I can't even spell right. Notice your calling, brethren, how not many wise men after the flesh, not many men, mighty, not many noble are called. Matthew chapter number 16, verse 17, Jesus said this to Peter. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Flesh and blood didn't reveal this unto you. God revealed this unto you. God's done it. Because guess what? You say, no, Brother Allen, you did. You helped me. I watched one of your videos or you told me about this and I believe because of you. No, you don't. Because guess what? I've shared this gospel with some people that wanted to punch my teeth out. So the fact that I told them, if it was me, then I should be able to, everybody I tell should just fall in love with Jesus. If I'm the one with the power, then every time, just because I told you I'm so powerful, Jesus is the Savior of the world. Oh, yes. Everybody should just automatically believe it. But you know what? It ain't me. It takes a revealing from God. If you believe the truth of the gospel, it's because God has took the blinders off of your eyes and you are part of a sanctified few that God only uses the minority. So quit being discouraged by being alone and let God be the one that fixes you the cake and water. Let Him feed you. I'm sure you're not saying we're lapping dogs. Lapping dogs. Exactly. That was the whole thing. That's, that was part of the point of that. Those that lap like a dog. And the point with the broken vessels, God uses broken vessels. Some of my closest, more intimate times with my Savior has been whenever I have been the most broken inside and felt the most worthless and felt the most alone and felt the most of a failure. That's whenever I have found God will let me preach and I get more, you know what I'm saying, I, more gets done. But boy, you let me come walking in with my puffed chest out thinking I've arrived. Things fall apart. 
things fall apart. Don't be discouraged. Be encouraged. Really smart men and the many are not telling you, they are telling you that it's not true, but the Bible says that really smart men and the many are not going to be the ones teaching this truth. Matter of fact, it absolutely says the opposite. So part one, one reason that I believe the salvation of all is true is the fact that this belief has got me and you separate than any other belief out there. Number two, the reason I believe that we're part of the, uh, the truth is because we're actually part of the few. I used to be told we were part of the few over there. What, remember that? Oh, yeah. Remember that? Oh, yeah. yeah, Baptist. They're few. Really? There's millions of them worldwide. One of the largest denominations in the world. What would you, what'd you say? <laughs> and they will continue to spread. Because in the last days, men will wax worse and worse. And actually think about it now. In 2018, I bet you the body of believers is smaller now than it's ever been in history. Because you got to think, it's been getting smaller through time. When Paul lived, that was probably the biggest amount of people that has ever really... But as the Catholic Church persecuted and killed and tried to beat it out and eternal torment doctrine was integrated into our churches, the believing body has gotten smaller and smaller and smaller over the last 2,000 years. I'm thankful that I'm a part of the minority. It is being a part of the minority that gives me assurance whenever I get discouraged. I let, I praise God, I am so glad there's nobody sitting in these chairs. Thank God for empty chairs. Woo! Glory! Thank the Lord for an empty bank account. Woo! I'm glad my wife ain't here tonight. Woo! The fewer the better. Praise God. Woo! Glory! There's certain preachers they won't shout unless the house is full. I want to learn to shout when they ain't here. It means we're doing something right. The truth will kill them, son. The truth will run them off. Be encouraged. Be encouraged. We're on the right track. Now, do we know it all? Nope. Not even going to claim to know it all. But God's left little breadcrumbs along the way to let us know you on the right track, son. I came to divide. That's right. He said, I come to divide. You say, well, I don't know what you mean by that. Tell your in-laws what you believe and you'll see what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, Caitlin, go tell your in-laws what you believe. See if Jesus come to put together or to divide. See? That is proof you're on the right track. Now our flesh, we like to be liked. We don't like to be, I don't like to be talked about. I don't like to be called names. So my flesh acts up once in a while. And it starts, man, am I even teaching? Am I lying to these people? I don't want to lie to these people. Am I on the right? And then God will drop a little breadcrumb. And I'll find a little breadcrumb and it'll be so encouraging. And guess what? Not only encouraging, it'll be biblical. And that's what just encourages us to go on. We're on the right track, Nina. Ain't no steeple on this building. Ain't one going to go on it. Amen? Amen. Lord, thank you. Thank you for such a small crowd tonight.
I thank you for those that are normally here but couldn't be here tonight. But even if they were all here, Lord, you know every name and you know every hair on everyone that's supposed to be here or should be here or could be here and we're still not the many. Thank you, Lord. This message has helped me probably more than anybody. But I do pray that it will go out and touch the hearts of those that are discouraged, those that are here, those that are on the Internet. Lord, let it encourage them to know. Don't let the majority, don't let peer pressure. And Lord, let us learn to be fed by you. You feed us. You feed us. You take care of us. Thank you. Thank you for assurance. Thank you for the scriptures that are just so plain now. Thank you for an eye-opening experience. Thanking you, Father, for each and every soul here that you've done that for. Let us realize how special we are. And let us give you the glory for it all. You've done the chosen, choosing, You've done the wiping away the scales. You've done the revealing. It's all you. And Lord, we look forward to the day that the Bible says that the veil will be taken off all men's eyes. We look forward to that day. And we'll not boast because it wasn't even of us that did it for us. It's all you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful night, guys. We love you. Lord willing, we'll be back next week for part three. And that'll be the end of it for this little series here, although there's more reasons why I believe that the reconciliation of all is truth. But these are the three, and I hope you can make it again. And until next week, we love you.